All right, construction champions, it's your host, Ron Nussbaum, and I'm here for another episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we talk about the ways that you can be the champion you were meant to be and help grow your construction business. Today, I have another rock star guest. Tommy, it is great to have you here with us today. Glad to be here. Appreciate the, <laughs> the opportunity. Awesome. Why don't you take a minute and tell the construction champions a little bit about yourself and what got us here to today? Yeah, so uh, started up in the garage store business 2007. Probably not the best time to start a business. It was good, great for a few months and then the market tanked. Um, a1 Garage Door Service started out just a guy in a truck, uh, didn't buy a business. Ended up going into some debt, just not knowing what I was doing for the first three years. Bought out my partner. So it's been about 16, 17 years now. And uh, recently we partnered with PE. We, uh, we'll do over 200 million this year, about 700 employees. And, you know, we've really crafted the systems that make a successful business. Standard operating procedures, checklists, the right CRM. Focusing on the people, the culture, which I know is a bad word to a lot of companies. But, uh, you know, the good news is, I've done every position there is to do in a home service company. And if I could do it, you know, we're going to do hopefully about 40 million of EBITDA this year. Plus we're buying companies aggressively in the garage store space. We're getting into flooring and storage in the garage. And uh, you know, Mondays are fun for me still. So my, I always tell people you got to start enjoying Mondays again. I love it. That's awesome. I'm super excited to have you here today. And I'm going to ask you the million dollar question, which is what makes a construction champion? You know, I, it, there's several things. It's having a plan. I think the main thing is understanding that you've got a plan and a budget and you have a goal that's written down and you're aggressively trying to grow. Cause I believe if you're not growing, you're sinking. And uh, I think a lot of people, they don't take advantage of their weaknesses. They don't hire for their weaknesses and they're just unorganized. They don't have a plan. They don't understand the numbers they need to hit. They don't know if they should be working on capacity planning or how to get trucks or how to train the people. So having a plan, being a talent uh, magnet and being able to have tough conversations. Those are the three factors I think what makes a, a, a champion in the home service space. That's awesome. So how, how was the path? of learning this stuff. So you're at, you're at, you know, the top of the echelon right now where, you know, a lot of guys are trying to get, but what, what was the first thing that was what clicked for you? That was like, man, this is actually fun. This is easy. I can do this. So obviously the opportunity to fail is important because, you know, the, I hear a lot of parents say, I wish I knew, I wish I could teach my kids what I know, but they got to be able to fail. So I've failed a lot and I got back up and learned from those mistakes. But in 2014, I hired a superstar integrator because I'm a visionary. So having somebody great to do HR, payroll, understand our CRM, build the price book correctly, focus on making sure I have the right data to make accurate decisions. 2014 was a big year. Then I got on service Titan in 2017. That was an amazing decision because they didn't want garage door companies. So I was able to talk the C uh, the CEO, his name's Ara Modesti, and it had given us a shot. So then we got a great CRM. And then I met Al Levy, the seven power contractor and built manuals, standard operating procedures. All my trucks look different. I, I went out there to find a good deal. Now I buy brand new vehicles. I'm able to write off the majority of it. Uh, they don't have breakdowns. It, it looks every truck looks the same now. We've got a service truck and a install truck, and I've got just a plan. You know, I, I know exactly what I'm going to do, and now I could guess my payroll within three percent every week. It's crazy how it works out. We we've got a lot of trainers. We've got a lot of recruiters. We're we're, we're growing. I've got thirty guys here training right now. So when you talk about a willingness to fail. And I, I agree with that. Like being being vulnerable to say, hey, we're going to step out here and we're going to try this. And it, if it doesn't work, we're going to readjust and continue on because you have that that end vision. What, what do you think are some of the biggest lessons that you learned from those failures along the way? Well, it's nice when you fail small. So when I was smaller, I could take bigger 
leaps of faith. And if I messed up, it wasn't like I was taking a million dollar business line of credit from the SBA or something. So I failed when I was smaller and I learned my lessons. And I've, I'll tell you two of the things I've done is I, I've become an avid reader. I read lots of books, home service, sales, marketing, recruiting. I spend a lot of time podcasting. I also, I go visit really, really successful HVAC shops and HVAC, these guys are all driving private planes. I know that sounds crazy, but they figured it out. They band together, they they work together. And there's a lot of networks out there uh, that help HVAC companies succeed. So I went to some of the biggest organizations uh, out there for HVAC training and partnered with them and learned from them. And I've applied what HVAC does with service agreements using financing, how they hire, uh, how they set up their trucks. And I kind of modeled that because it's the most successful, really one of the best businesses in home service. So I modeled after that, spent time with winners, asked a lot of questions. And I think going into a business that's doing 500 million a year, you just learn a lot. You ask a lot of questions. You you visit the CFO, the CMO, the COO. I spend time with that company. And you can learn a lot if you're willing to make the effort to get out of your comfort zone and apply what these people have already learned. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of knowledge out there. And there's a lot of opportunities to continuously learn. Uh, I see you have a whole stack of books back there behind you. What What's some of the stuff that helped you move the ball? What are some of your favorite books? Yeah, The Seven Power Contractor is amazing. E-Myth is amazing. Uh, there's a book called Who about recruiting is amazing. Uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I make every one of my technicians read Go for No. Um, uh, really great book, Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Um, the books go on and on. I mean, if I'm looking back here, uh, The Four Disciplines of Execution, it was a great book. Uh, there's most of my books I read are sales, marketing, recruiting focused. Um, I'm not a big fiction reader and there's always gold nuggets that I can pull out of a lot of these books around me. This is a great book, a hundred million offers by Alex Hermosi. Um, and this is my newest book and they just came in today. Elevate, build a business where everybody wins. So I wrote the book, the home service millionaire. I had 12 co-authors that came out about six years ago. And I think that book is a game changer for a lot of businesses. All right. And what, so that's your brand new book that ju is just coming out. And what, what's the, what's some of the, the reason behind writing that book? So I just, I found out in business that a lot of people have this mentality that the competitors are like, they're super private and they don't ever meet up and they don't learn from each other. When you're able to elevate the entire industry, and the employees need to win, the customers need to win, the partnerships need to win, the vendors need to win, and I need to win. And in business, it doesn't have to be, we can all make money. There's more water in the ocean that'll for everybody. So the book is about really understanding the elevate mindset, the how to have the right meetings, how to really care about the people. I find that motivating people is what's in it for them. How do they accomplish their dreams in your business? They want to take their dad on a fishing expedition to Alaska. They want to take their kids to Disney World. They want to own several houses. They want to buy a new vehicle. They want to take their wife on a 10-year honeymoon and renew their vows. Whatever those are, motivate them by what they want instead of what you want as a company. Because these people have lives. They have families. They want a lot too. So when you understand the Elevate mindset of everybody's winning, making money, accomplishing their dreams, work becomes a lot more fun. Yeah, and I, I think we have within the industry, this stigma of, like you just said, the secretive, like everybody's super secretive. It's don't, don't say this, or don't talk to this person about that. This is what we're doing. Nobody should know, but that's the opposite of what the industry should be. If we're going to continue to grow it, continue to expand it, we need to all come to other and work towards an end outcome to other instead of just singly. Yeah, when I started really inviting people into my shop in the in the garage door industry and showing them service time and showing them exactly how I do my performance pay, all of a sudden I was the good guy and everybody wants to share with me and everybody's got ideas. So I started Garage Door Freedom. Now I have 50 companies that we work together to build this an amazing company with better pricing and just better technicians, better processes. And I'm going to get Garage Door Freedom into the 500 companies. Mm. 
That's awesome. So what was the herder like? Say, you know, we have John over down the road and he's wanting to start to meet up with some of his local contractors in his area. What's the, what, what's the best way you think for him to go do that? What's the herders that he's going to have to overcome? I mean, what worked for me is uh, the podcast. I mean, I just reach out to people. I hear of a lot of people. If somebody reaches out to me and says, hey, I'd like to come in and do a shop tour. I do sh two shop tours a month. I mean, the, you, you'll figure out real quick the people that are willing to give. And there's a lot of them out there because it's kind of like paying it forward. So you find the right companies. Gettle is a great example with Ken Goodrich. But I, I, I've hung out with the guys at Gettle, I have my buddy Keegan with Best Home Services, Leland Smith with Service Champions. Um, I, there's so many people I've spent a lot of time with, Jamie Domenico. It's crazy across the United States. And so going and helping them and they help me, it's like we're watching each other's backs. I'm involved in a lot of messages that are group texts that we're always helping each other, learning about new ideas and testing different things in marketing. And it's just the gift that keeps giving. So I think you just got to be willing to get yourself out there and ask. Asking mm -hmm. is the hardest part is asking for help and saying, hey, I'd love to take you to lunch and shoot the shit with you for a while. And I think people just got to not be afraid to ask. Same thing in sales. You got to ask for the sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you had referenced the Go For No book earlier. And that's a great book when you're talking about asking. Like you got to get out there and ask and you got to continuously ask. And you'll find the right people to get around. Because the last thing you want to do is spend the wrong, spend time around the wrong people. And from everything that you've said here so far, it, it's all people. Whether it's who you're around, who you're hiring, who's on the team, and, and then studying those people and making sure that you take what's working and then implement that at a, at a high level. Yeah, the systems and processes are everything. People ask me what's more important: the people, the product, or the process. And, I tell them the process dictates the how the product comes in. The process dictates how we hire. The process is everything. It's it's the recruiting. It's the org chart. It's the manuals. And it sounds cliche, manual, standard operating procedures. But the fact is, when you get a standard operating procedure for how you get people, the ride-along forms, the background checks, the drug tests, how you order their vehicle and their iPad, how they get their tools, how they're set up for a success it's not always perfect and no business is, but it really, it's great to have a plan and have people that are accountable, have data and integrity teams to make sure everything is going as planned. And that starts with a great CRM and a great policies and procedures. And I think a lot of people are firefighters. I was a firefighter for 10 years. I can put out any problem. I can fix the bad reviews, but there was no processes in place because it was the blind leading the blind. I didn't know what I was supposed to do the next day because there was eight, 18 problems. So if there was a problem, I put it in the manual. Hey, how do you do time off? What happens if your car breaks down? What happens if you get a tattoo on your face? What are our policies for all this stuff? And it's just, this is our, our manuals. I have 40 manuals. I have just the technician manual, 65 pages. It explains everything from soup to nuts, how they get paid, any questions they might have. And it's a living, breathing document that changes over time to confront the issues we're having. So people know where to go to look for answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, as you scale anything, I haven't done it on the level you did, uh, but went from about a few million to 25 plus, it's all systems. Like, and then those systems, you outgrow those systems and you have to build new ones, but it, it truly is a living document of what you're talking about. Like, you have to be willing to allow your systems to grow with your business as you grow, or else you can't continue to grow. It's, you know, there are a lot of things that I realized too, is some business owners do new construction. Some of them work with Costco, Home Depot. Some of them do commercial. Some of them just do retrofit. And I wouldn't say there's a one size fits all. They're different. They're, they're specialists. The more specialists you get, I've got separate installers. I've got separate guys that do maintenance agreements. And so really finding specialists that do great is the, the best way I found to scale. Whereas there's a lot of people that do dispatching. I do all the purchasing I do the CSR, I answer the phones, I, I lead the meetings. And when they're kind of involved with everything, it's hard to hold them accountable for one thing because they're like, listen, I, I'm trying to do it all. And there's no accountability because if everybody's accountable, then nobody's accountable. And we've got scorecards for every department. So everybody knows what their key performance indicators are and how they get rated. And that's their salary and how they get paid too. It's not salary, but it's performance pay. Hmm. 
Yeah, it's what you're saying is exactly what guys have to do. As you're going from 500 to a million, a million to two, five to 10, 10 to 20, this is all stuff that can be implemented and continue to be implemented and continues to grow. You know, it was interesting. I saw this post on Facebook the other day and the, the guy said, I wish there was more podcasts with companies only doing 2 million. And I'm thinking to myself, is that really who you want to learn from? Or do you want to go from somebody that's been to two to five to 20 to 50 to a hundred to 200? Because what are you going to hear all the fires that happen in a $2 million business all, all day? And just what, maybe the guys will relate to that more, but I'd rather hang out with a billion dollar company and learn what they've done because success leaves clues. And mm -hmm. I know sometimes we feel like a lot of people that are smaller than I am. I, I was that size too. And I know the steps I needed to take to get to where we're at today. And it was really taking my time holding people accountable with checklists and scorecards and having really great meetings and letting them know what their position was and how they were going to be graded. And I'll tell you what, we spend money hiring the best of the best and one A player equals three B players. And people got to understand how they make money. They got to understand what, how they grow in the company. I mean, we've got a path to get guys out of the trucks and I don't think a lot of companies have that path. So it, there's not one answer. There's, there's a lot of things that have to take place, but readers are leaders, go get training, go get help, make it to some of these events, talk to people in your industry and outside of your industry. That's the first step. And you know, I, I'm I'm big on retrofit. I, I think new construction could be a great business, but it it comes and it comes and goes in peaks and valleys with the economy. Whereas retrofit, it's all about discretionary versus non discretionary income for some of these things. And so, mm -hmm. well, garage doors are demand service, so it's basically recession proof because when your garage door breaks and your car's stuck, you you, you want to get it fixed, just like if your HVAC breaks or your drain is is leaking, you know. Yeah, I know. And what you're saying is, I mean, it's one of the reasons I started this podcast because I just wanted to get the information out there because I feel like having these conversations is better than not having them. everybody. Everybody thinks like all this stuff happens behind closed doors. And a lot of the conversations that we've had on the show are the conversations that need to happen out in front of everybody. So they understand, hey, Tommy, one day was there, but he made the decision that he wasn't going to be a $20 million operation. He's going to be bigger, and he kept going after it, and it's completely possible. And it's possible to go from wherever you are to that next step. You just have to take responsibility for the action that's required to get there. Well, it's complete accountability, too. I think a lot of business owners, they go, if I don't do it, it won't get done right. I'm the only one accountable. I if I don't, you know, they, they've got to fix everything, but if they trust people and it's, it's a hiring and it's setting it up to hire the right person that'll take accountability. Cause once you get a couple of key players, like my executive assistant and my COO, my CFO, these guys are busting their butts, but they've got incentive in the business. They've got an equity incentive. And I think an equity incentive program to give people ownership that is vested over time is a smart play because, you know, people are like, I never want to give my business away, but I'd rather take a big piece of a huge pie than the a complete piece of a tiny pie because no one has invested interest in the outcome. So with performance pay and equity incentive program, getting people aligned, having the right org chart, the right processes, everybody's rowing in the same direction. And that's what causes us to grow at a rapid pace. Yeah. And I love your perspective on the equity and giving some of that up. I've met all the business owners that are very successful doing that because you create that buy-in. It's, it's hard when you're rowing the boat and not everybody has a piece of the boat, but you start giving some of that out. It, it can completely change how your culture is and how people perform because now, you know, they got that buy-in. So private equity companies all do what they call profit units. Usually it's 10 to 15% where people could earn if milestones are hit. So it's not like you're just carte blanche giving money and equity out. And typically, if let's just say your company's $5 million and you guys are doing a million bottom line, that's where the equity starts when you go to do it. It doesn't start, you're not giving equity out. That's the floor. So it's not like you're giving all your hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, the weekends and relationships you've gone through. You're starting it 
at a date where they could actually influence the outcome. So it's a lot of people think, man, I, if my business is doing a million of EBITDA and I'm five X, I'm worth 5 million. Well, 5 million is where it would start at the floor. If that's the value you're going to give it. And if they, if they hit 3 million of EBITDA, there could be equity dispersed to the main decision makers and some of the leadership and coach coaching staff. So I, I think it's a great opportunity because it helps few things. Number one, it helps the culture. Number two, it helps accountability. Number three, with buy-in. Number four, it, it, it's kind of like golden handcuffs because they're not leaving when they got equity in the company. They're an owner now. And now they've got invested in interest to go double the company and double every year. And they're making different decisions from a different mindset. So I think the smartest companies in the world use equity to motivate their leadership team. And the people that aren't doing it, maybe it's because they're selfish. Maybe it's because they don't understand how to do it. But I definitely invest some time in learning how to do that because you could attract some of the best talent. If I told you, listen, we're a million dollars of EBITDA. I've got a plan and I'm going to show you my plan how to get us to five, but I need help. At five million, if we got four extra million and we're seven X at that point, that's 28 million. If I give them 3%, they're a millionaire now. Mm. Um, so understanding typically profit units, you want to do 10 to 15% and you don't want to give them all up. They vest usually over five years. So if you're going to give away 1%, you're giving away 0.2% each year for five years. No one's going anywhere. If they lie, cheat, or steal, they lose their equity. Um, so the, 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 they're on board and it's great to recruit these people because they're like, man, if I could be a millionaire in five years, just by coming and giving it my all. Plus they're making their normal salary and bonus compensation. So it's it's what the smartest companies do in the world. So I just took a note out of their playbook. <laughs> I think that's something uh, from this whole conversation I can take away. And I think all the listeners can take away is you've done a very good job of getting around the best and having an understanding of what the best looks like to be able to go learn from them. Yeah, I... I'm around winners all the time. If you if you want to really figure out a way to be successful, you want to be a better dad or you want to make more money or you want to be a better husband, you look at the four closest friends that you're around, divide it by four, add up their income. Usually 90% of the time you'll fall within 20% of their income. So if you want to be a billionaire, you better start hanging around with billionaires. If you want to be a successful father, hang around with great dads and learn from them because a lot of times people are like, I don't want to hang out with this guy because he's just light years ahead of me. Imagine what you'll learn. They've been through what you're going through. And it's hard for me to go back to $2 million. But the first thing I look at is, do you have a good system? Do you know what your conversion rate is? Do you know what your booking rate is? Do you know what your average ticket is? And how much does it cost you to acquire a client? Because if you don't have those numbers, then how, how do you know what you should be working at? Do you need to train more? Should you be increasing your price book? And any business owner, here's something that everybody needs to learn. Your business should be able to pay you six figures and the business should be able to make 15% on top of paying you. A lot of business owners say, yeah, I made 200 grand last year. I'm like, what did the company make? They're like, I just told you 200 grand. I'm like, no, you paid yourself 200 grand. The business should have made 15% on top of that. So if you're running a business as a job, that's a lot of stress and anxiety just to make a couple hundred grand. That's not... Unfortunately, here's how I measure a business. If you were to leave, I'm I'm paying for you and your whole family to come to Hawaii with me. And we're leaving in two hours. Now, here's the contingency. I'm paying for everything. I'm paying for the dolphins and the volcano tours. I'm paying for all the food. When you When you come back in a month, and you're not allowed to call your business, so one month from now, how does it look? If it doesn't look good, then that's not a real business because it depends on you. A business should not depend on one person to function correctly. A business should be its own equilibrium and run without the owner. And that's by that's systems and that's an org chart and putting these things together. That, and I, I'm not trying to be condescending because I was there. I was the guy that ran the business. When I didn't go in, shit fell apart and fires happened. And now it runs without me. And that's what gives a lot of value to the business. Yeah. And I, I think like the more people hear that and the more they understand, like that is what gives you the freedom to continue to grow the business. If you're running around putting fires out all the time, you can't be out putting your other comp plans to bring in the best talent out there in order to get to that next level. You know, when I was small, I, uh, smaller of a company, 
I was used to hear work on the business, not in the business. And it never really clicked until I really got to focus on building comp plans and understanding how to make the training better and understanding how to get a better deal on the vehicles and how we were going to recruit and build the ride along forms. That was on the business, right? Getting inventory dialed and making sure all the vans are uniform. When you're busy all day working with builders and talking to relationships and trying to coach your guys and not have people, you're working in the business all day, just helping revenue come in. When you're actually able to build the systems and sit back and look at this and say, I've got a guy running the business. Now I'm going to work on the growth side of it. It completely changes because things can become a lot easier when you're not torn into pull, getting pulled away all the time. Hey, I, this guy got in an accident. Hey, this guy pissed off a customer. We got a one-star review. We lost this realtor that we worked with. That's tough if you don't have people in place. So that's where you got to start. Best advice I could give is get it, one of those old-fashioned calendars that's like a book, right? And put in there what you got to get done, the three things you got to get done today. And every time you get distracted or pulled away, write that thing down and figure out a system or another person to handle that. Because you look at, I figured out what I make an hour and it's astronomically high and I'm not bragging. And I said, is this worth my time? Is this, is this thing that, can I pay somebody to handle these distractions? Getting an executive assistant, not going through email, having scheduled meetings. You know, I was prepped for this because it was on my calendar. My executive assistants set me up for this. And if you look at how much you get pulled away in a small business from the things that matter, that just tie up a lot of time, it's, it, you look at it and you go, man, I, I work 60 hours, but I only work three hours to really help the business this week. I was too busy going and fixing this job or doing a site check or training this employee and that stuff matters when you're small. You got to do everything. But you first, you got to find your biggest distraction and hire for that person. And one of the big, another piece of advice is get somebody great on your finance side that understands taxes, understands a cost segregation study when you buy a building, understands uh, advanced depreciation that you can write off on a new, uh, if you buy a new truck, you can write off 80% this year if it's over 6,200 pounds. There's the Augusta tax rule. By not having great KPIs and not having a great balance sheet and income statement, which probably 99 of businesses fail at, you don't really know where you're going. You don't know if you should be growing or you should be fixing. Because there's a lot of times you got to pump the brakes and make sure you might have to do, uh, you might have to replace somebody in top grade. But by not knowing, by not having individual KPIs to know where the money's coming from and who's doing the best, a lot of people think, man, I need to run all the guys equally. I'm like, well, there's no tenure in my company. The top the top performers get the first opportunity on anything, whether that's a phone call for a dispatcher or a technician or an install. Mm. So people have this, capitalism wasn't supposed to be fair. It's survival of the fittest. It's Darwinism. And if, if, if you don't like it, there's a lot of socialist, you know, go to Finland or Denmark or something and <laughs> Sweden and it's, it's not the same, but they've got a bunch of oil money. People don't realize, but capitalism survival of the fittest yeah I, I love it man you're dropping information that everybody should take heed to should definitely i mean there's so many business owners out there that look at it as i'm just i'm not working for somebody else so i'm better off but your life is miserable and it doesn't have to be that way you just have to be able to take accountability for it and understand this is what you need to do. And you're laying out the playbook right now. Well, your business is not really worth anything if I got to pay to replace you and you're the guy with all the relationships. A lot of people think their business is worth, hey, man, I did 300 grand last year. Well, to replace you is going to be 100 grand. So you'll get a multiple maybe on 200 and it's probably going to be three or four X. So your big retirement, it's a lot of money. It's 600, 800 grand, but Ultimately, if you want to build a business that's worth a lot of money with a bigger multiple, it's called arbitrage. If I buy a business for, let's say, 5X, I'm worth 15X because I've got systems and they don't rely all on me. So it's a much safer investment. So people will pay more because I'm getting good ROIs on their money, right? So I people mm -hmm. will invest in me because it's not me as the company. If I don't need to be here for the company to run. And that should be the goal of every single business owner. And if if you want a business just to give you a good living, Business is hard, man. I mean, you lose relationships. You work crazy hours. It's hard to be a good parent. It's hard to be a good um, life partner. And if you decide to do that, you got to realize you want to grow something big that's worth a lot of value. There's a great company uh, book, John Warlow, 
built to sell. And you should build a business, even if you don't plan on selling it, it should be available to sell. Because if you don't have something that's sellable, then why, why do you wake up and work weekends and work nights and you're on the phone all the time and sacrificing so much time and energy if you're not building something that's worth a lot of money? Mm. Awesome. I love it. I love everything that you've talked about here today. I think there's a, a lot of golden nuggets in there, Tommy. Uh, where, if anybody wanted to find you, where's the best place to reach out, to follow you? Where where are those spots at? So there's a few. Uh, on Instagram and TikTok, I put out a lot of content. Official Tommy Mello. Um, no W, M-E-L-L-O, Official Tommy Mello. Um, the book I just wrote, it's, you can find it at book.elevateandwin.com, book period elevateandwin.com. Um, I've got a podcast, uh, 40,000 downloads a month. It's what I try to do with my podcast is just find the best person in recruiting and get them on the podcast, like a recruiter that did it for 40 years or a very successful entrepreneur. Very, my podcast, it's called uh, Home Service Expert. It's really for business owners. I don't get a lot of technicians and the, I get the technician mindset in there, but we learn on getting the right CSRs, dispatchers, the right systems, the right checks and balances. And I interview, you know, smart business owners, smart marketers, smart people that know how to set up a fleet. And it's funny because I had a guy tell me, he's like, dude, I went from 2 million to 10 million by listening to one through 40 of your podcasts. And then from 40 to 80, I went from 10 to 20 million because I was going through that when I started the podcast in 2017, I was doing like seven, $8 million. And so when you listen to it, it's like different questions for different size companies. And as I grew, the, the, the questions started to get elevated. I mean, it, it was harder questions, but they were like tax, understanding finances and taxes. I don't necessarily think that if you're doing $2 million, that's where all your time and energy should go. So I tell, if you listen to all of them and it's a lot, but it, it, it's, it's kind of tells a story of how I grew to this size and how I'm sure in three years, when you listen to my podcast, it'll be how I did a billion in revenue, you know? Awesome. I love it. And thank you for everything you do for the industry, all the knowledge, the willingness to put it out there, man. It's been a blast. Thank you for being on the episode today. Thank you. I appreciate your time today. <laughs> all right, construction champions, another jam packed episode where we just talked about the systems that it takes to get to the next level. No matter where you're going, there's a system that you have to put in place. But my biggest takeaway is, is to get around the people that already have wrote them at the highest possible level and then learn from them. Be humble enough to ask for a seat at the table and then be humble enough to take the notes and learn what they're doing. Don't be afraid to go collaborate. Go to the biggest guy in your town. Because just like Tommy said, there's no reason to build this if you're not building something that's worth it at the end. Because it is a really stressful job to have to be a business owner when you're just out there in whitewater all the time. So construction champions, until next time, be the champion you were meant to be. Introducing BuilderCons the construction communication software that's changing the game. Say goodbye to communication challenges and hello to effortless communication. With BuilderComs, you can communicate with clients, share pictures, videos, and documents, and keep clients informed about the progress of their projects. Get real-time updates, prevent miscommunications and delays, and ensure successful projects. Don't let bad communication ruin your construction projects. Try BuilderComs today. Visit us at buildercoms.com.